The Mesozoic era is often referred to as the Age of Reptiles, and for pretty good reason. The archosaurs, or ruling reptiles, dominated ecosystems from the Triassic all the way through to the Cretaceous, while mammals stayed mainly in their shadows. Most famous of the archosaurs are of course the dinosaurs, best known from huge charismatic animals such as Stegosaurus, Tyrannosaurus and Triceratops. But those were all Jurassic or Cretaceous dinosaurs. The earliest dinosaurs started much more humbly as small, long-legged and probably bipedal animals. So how did these famous and well-loved creatures rise to prominence from such modest beginnings in the Triassic? The Triassic opened 250 million years ago on an apocalyptic landscape off the back of the Permian-Triassic extinction, the most devastating extinction in the history of life. With over 90% of species having vanished as a result of the extinction, the survivors were free to diversify into all kinds of weird and wonderful forms, such as herbivorous rhynchosaurs, reptiles with beaks and unusual teeth, the tree-climbing drapanosaurs with a strange mishmash of features, and ichthyosaurs, which, despite looking like a fish or a dolphin, were actually reptiles. One group that did particularly well in the Triassic were the archosaurs, and despite the group's past anatomical diversity, Today, the archosaurs are represented only by birds and crocodiles. The two broadest divisions of archosaurs are the Pseudosuchians, which contain crocodiles and their relatives, and the Ornithodira, which contain birds and their closest relatives, including the dinosaurs. Pseudosuchia seemed to dominate at first, while Ornithodira remained largely in the background, and true dinosaurs didn't even appear until 20 million years into the Triassic. That changed in the late Triassic, when the dinosaurs began the first of their expansive radiations, and the Pseudosuchians seemed to decline. After the end of the Triassic, which featured another mass extinction, only the crocodile lineage, called crocodilomorphs, remained of the Pseudosuchians, whereas dinosaurs went on to diversify into some of the most iconic animals to ever walk the Earth. But we want to know what happened to cause this turnover of Archosaurian dominance. It's possible that just by chance the Pseudosuchians were much more affected by the severe climate change at the end of the Triassic. There was, after all, a lot of environmental upheaval during this time, with drastic changes in humidity and floral compositions of ecosystems. And at the end of the period, it's likely that massive volcanic eruptions ultimately led to the extinction event that claimed many of the Pseudosuchians. But it's also very likely that the Pseudosuchians' collapse in diversity was in part caused by the rise of dinosaurs. A number of ways in which the dinosaurs could have contributed to the demise of their Pseudosuchian rivals has been proposed across the years. Maybe the dinosaurs, with their more bird-like system of air sacs, could breathe more efficiently, and this helped them survive. Maybe the fact that they grew faster were warm-blooded helped. Maybe it was something to do with the way that they moved. It could have even been a combination of two or more of these factors that helped them thrive. Today, the Dawn Dinos team is focusing on testing the locomotor superiority hypothesis, which proposes that the dinosaurs were better at walking, running, and perhaps even jumping than other archosaurs were. And perhaps this is what gave them an edge and allowed them to diversify in the late Triassic, and not only survive, but thrive after the Triassic-Jurassic extinctions. But this hypothesis is not new, and we will investigate some of the key players in bringing this hypothesis to where it is today, whether they agree with the locomotor superiority hypothesis or not. In 1974, Bakker and Galton published a paper discussing the differences in dinosaur and general thecodont anatomy. Today, thecodont is considered an outdated group name. This term was previously used to refer to the animals within the broader archosaurian lineage that aren't dinosaurs, pterosaurs or crocodilians. This means that thecodontia is paraphyletic. It contains the common ancestor of a group, but not all of its descendants, and thus isn't a real evolutionary group, but more of a wastebasket. Traditional groupings like Thecodontia were made on the basis of shared features, such as the teeth that sit within a socket that give Thecodontia its name. These days we focus more on shared ancestry when defining groups, rather than arbitrary traits or modes of life. Although Bakker and Galton's work is most important for our purposes, as it first proposed the locomotor superiority hypothesis, the paper was primarily used as evidence for monophyly or evolutionary unity of dinosauria. If we go back to our phylogenetic trees. Monophyletic groups contrast paraphyletic clades like Thecodontia in that they include the last common ancestor of a group 
and all its descendants. In this paper, Bakker and Galton were arguing that rather than different branches of dinosaurs having come from several ancestors, the group was united by one common ancestor. This is what is universally believed to be the case today. But back to dinosaur locomotion. Bakker and Galton determined that the way dinosaurs moved gave them an edge in survival over Pseudosuchians and other groups. They summed it up nicely, saying, The dinosaur radiation was based on a concentration of behavioural, physiological and anatomical adaptations for high sustained running speeds that made them irresistible predators and competitors to contemporary Thecodontians and larger mammal-like reptiles. Their work was done by comparing the relevant locomotor anatomy, such as the bones of the legs, feet and pelvis of dinosaurs and other animals, to estimate how well they worked relative to each other. Over the next decade or so, others weighed in on this new hypothesis, with most studies focusing on the differences between dinosaur upright posture compared to the sprawling or semi-erect postures of contemporary synapsids and pseudosuchians. Bonaparte in 1984 considered that some pseudosuchians, namely the carnivorous rausuchids, had also developed an erect limb posture, which can potentially show that these animals had just as improved movement as the dinosaurs. However, he determined that the dinosaur arrangement was superior, focusing particularly on the positioning of the femur and hips and highlighting the way that dinosaurs stand tiptoed rather than flat-footed as the pseudosuchians primarily did. In 1986, Parrish took this further and looked at other groups of pseudosuchians that had developed an erect posture. Again, he noted that this posture shift from sprawling to upright could well have provided an advantage in terrestrial habitats. And he credited the dinosaur foot as well as other subtle anatomical differences as major advantages over all pseudosuchian groups. Whilst of course this is still important work, it being the 70s and 80s, these studies didn't have the same computational power that we have today to build digital models and run complex biomechanical calculations to test how anatomy relates to potential behaviour. They were constrained by the technology of the day and so were restricted in the methods they could use in this regard. And they were simply working with fewer specimens and knowledge than we have now. And although it's clear from this work that opinion was shifting, until recently at the time, dinosaurs had still generally been considered cold-blooded, slow-moving, unintelligent failures of evolution. The next decade saw a boom in paleontological research and discovery. And of course, not everyone was on board with the locomotion superiority hypothesis. In 1983, Benton rejected more competitive models such as the locomotor superiority hypothesis and instead proposed a hypothesis of opportunistic replacement to explain the rise of dinosaurs. In other words, dinosaurs may have just been fortunate holders of a winning evolutionary lottery ticket. He focused on patterns of relative abundance and diversity of species throughout the Triassic and determined, based on what he saw, that it was more likely the pseudosuchians and synapsids were just unlucky in extinction events. The Triassic was an environmentally turbulent time, and this led to a number of important changes of plant groups. As the plant life changed, so did the animals, and what had been ideal ecosystems for reptiles such as rhynchosaurs and mammal-related synapses such as the beaked and tusked dicynodonts could no longer support them. Thus, more opportunistic dinosaurs could move in and replace those reptiles and synapsids. In terms of what happened with the Pseudosuchians, their numbers also dwindled in the late Triassic, and Benton again saw that the Triassic-Jurassic extinction was catastrophic for the group. Due to the demise of most Pseudosuchians, the dinosaurs were able to diversify throughout the late Triassic, and then explosively diversify in the Jurassic, thanks to the space left by those Pseudosuchians that didn't make it. By looking at various faunas spanning the length of the Triassic from a number of locations around the world, Benton was able to study how global fauna composition changed over time. Repeatedly, as other groups declined, dinosaurs moved in to fill the ecological space they left behind. Rather than competition or dinosaurs being superior to the other fauna, it was environmental factors that led to their ultimate success. Benton's has perhaps been the prevailing view for some time now, and more recent work only seems to strengthen his hypothesis. To better understand the ecological relationships between dinosaurs and pseudosuchians, we need to look at some of these later studies. In 2008, Brissate and colleagues published on a similar theme, focusing instead on the differences between Pseudosuchians and Ornithodira. Again, the results of this study show that the Pseudosuchians died out by chance, save the line leading to the crocodiles, of course, despite being more morphologically diverse in the Triassic. Morphology here just refers to the shape of something, so the Pseudosuchia at this time exhibited a wide variety of body plans, whereas today, crocodilians show very low morphological diversity, which we also call disparity. They're all a pretty similar shape. 
Brissate's study argued that dinosaurs, rather than being in direct competition with the archosaurs they lived with for 30 million years, diversified together alongside them, although it wasn't until after the Triassic that dinosaurs reached similar levels of disparity as that seen in Triassic pseudosuchians. Another paper that followed this vein was published by Bernardi and colleagues in 2018. This study focused on evidence from footprints in a more localised setting to show that the timing of the first major radiation of dinosaurs coincided with the environmental upheaval of the Carnian Pluvial Episode, or CPE. The CPE is recognised as being a period of two million years in the late Triassic when the climate dramatically shifted from arid, as it was throughout most of the Triassic, to extremely humid and back to arid again. This study used precise dating techniques to date a rock sequence in the Southern Alps and studied the archosaur footprints found throughout. There were no dinosaur footprints present before the CPE, but plenty of Pseudosuchian tracks, and after the CPE, dinosaur tracks were abundant and the number of Pseudosuchian tracks was greatly reduced. This rapid faunal turnover helps provide more evidence that the gradual faunal replacement of Pseudosuchians was greatly accelerated by the environmental changes of the late Triassic. Bernardi's study suggests that the CPE was the beginning of the end for many Pseudosuchian lineages. Altogether, this idea of opportunistic replacement sounds very convincing. However, these studies have only taken into account measures of abundance, diversity and disparity in relation to gross morphology. There's still a lot more to consider, especially in regards to actually looking at and comparing how these animals were moving, or looking at physiological mechanisms. In 2012, Kubo and Kubo published a paper that compared how cursorial Triassic ornithodirans were relative to other archosaurs around at the time. Cursoriality refers to how well adapted for running an animal is, especially in regard to the length of its legs. In living mammals, we generally see a trend that those with longer legs in proportion to their overall body size run faster than those with shorter legs. A dramatic comparison of this would be how much faster a horse can run compared to a sausage dog. Even if you shrank that horse down to dog size, it would likely still outrun its canine competition. However, this correlation between long legs and speed doesn't always hold up. For example, both giraffes and flamingos have extremely long legs, but neither is exactly known for speed. Because of this, we can't say that just because an extinct animal has the long leg proportions that might mean it was a fast runner, it was, but it does make it more likely. More sophisticated modern methods, such as geometric morphometrics, can address these anatomical differences in greater detail and allow us to better figure out function. In the Kubo study, they tackled their research questions using methods rather similar to the traditional methods originally used to formulate the locomotor superiority hypothesis. Comparative anatomy was their main input data, and as I just discussed, was used as a proxy for function rather than biomechanically testing it. The relative length of the bones in the fore and hind limb were used as a morphological signal to determine two things about their study animals, which were more likely to be bipedal and which were more likely to be cursorial. This approach may have been traditional, but that doesn't mean it's not effective, and Kubo and Kubo were working with a much more current understanding of the methods and animals they were looking at than had been available before. This is due in part to a number of new discoveries of archosaurs. The discovery of Silosaurids, beaked close cousins of dinosaurs, or perhaps even early dinosaurs, and an improved understanding of the proto-dinosaurs called dinosauromorphs have added to our knowledge and allowed us to fill in gaps in dinosaur evolution. And the discovery of bipedality in non-dinosauromorph groups such as the popasaurs and effigia have made us reconsider the differences between Pseudosuchia and Ornithodira. These species hadn't been investigated in this context before, and so new information from studying them here led to more precise and accurate results, especially in conjunction with more refined methods of comparison, such as morphospace plots, which numerically test and visualise how different the anatomies of animals are. Kubo and Kubo came to the conclusion that in general, ornithodirans plotted as being more cursorial than pseudosuchia, and so this could have ultimately led to their success. However, they didn't stop there. In further work, Kubo and Kubo took into account data from footprints and trackways left by archosaurs in the late Triassic and came to a similar conclusion, that dinosaurs were able to move faster than their Pseudosuchian cousins. Speed is reasonably easy to work out from trackways. We can take the distance between footprints and the approximate hip height of the animal that made them and calculate from there. Although it does depend on accurately estimating hip height, this is still one of the most powerful techniques we have for figuring out the speed of extinct animals. A few years later, they also published work that considered the fact that dinosaur morphs were the only animals that exhibited tiptoed or non-plantigrade foot posture in the Mesozoic. 
There are a number of terms that can describe the way an animal stands on its feet, like plantigrade, digitigrade, and ungulagrade. Plantigrade means that it stands on the whole surface of the foot, with the heel touching the ground, flat-footed. This style of standing is seen in most archosaurs and humans, for example. Digitigrade refers to standing on just the toes. This foot posture is what is seen in dinosaurs, both extinct ones and living birds. Ungulagrade refers to animals that stand on hooves, effectively right on their tiptoes in the way that cows and horses do. Kubo's study found that an increase in body size throughout evolving lineages was present in non-plantigrade animals that evolved from a plantigrade ancestor, and no such relationship was seen in those that remained plantigrade throughout their lineage. This increase in body size was seen in non-flying dinosaurs in the Mesozoic in a dramatic way, with the cat-sized dinosaurs of the Triassic eventually changing to become the enormous sauropods of the Jurassic and Cretaceous, among a myriad of other huge forms. And this trend has been echoed in non-plantigrade mammals of the Cenozoic. This ability to grow and adapt afforded to dinosaurs by their foot anatomy could have helped them overcome environmental change. It certainly seemed to enable their gigantism. And the greater speed ability evidenced by longer legs and lengthy steps from fossil footprints match the bipedal nature and tiptoed foot posture of many early dinosauromorphs. It all fit together. Dinosauromorph anatomy made them faster. This work has shone a light on the fact that perhaps a model of dinosaur diversification based on being superior to Pseudosuchians in some regard warrants further investigation. At the very least, luck may not have been the only thing the dinosaurs had going for them. Further and more detailed work is required to tease out what happened in the late Triassic that led to the incredible diversity of dinosaurs we see from the Jurassic onwards. Luckily, you're in the right place to learn about what comes next for the locomotor superiority hypothesis. The Dawn Dinos project is based at the Royal Veterinary College's Structure and Motion Laboratory in the United Kingdom, and is spearheaded by Professor John Hutchinson, who says, our project seeks to rigorously test the locomotor superiority hypothesis through the use of biomechanical modeling and simulation. Specifically, we're investigating whether dinosaurs could run faster or jump further or walk more efficiently than contemporary pseudosuchians using 12 extinct archosaurs for comparisons. Now all of this research should tell us whether the dinosaurs' ways of locomoting gave them an advantage in surviving and thriving. Rather than use anatomy as a proxy for speed or other aspects of athleticism, we're using physiology and physics to test how these factors are related. The testing done as part of the project is more detailed than any previous study and makes use of new and improving technology. It first involves studying the way that extant archosaurs, specifically a small bird called the tinamou and the Nile crocodile, move. By inputting the known musculoskeletal anatomy and experimental data of these animals into specialised software, we can inform computer simulations to recreate the movements we see in reality digitally. These extant archosaurs were chosen as they are homologues to those extinct animals of interest, meaning that their anatomy is directly related to those of the Triassic Pseudosuchians and Ornithodirans that will also be studied. The Nile crocodile, throughout its growth, shows a range of terrestrial gaits that can be compared with various Triassic Pseudosuchians, and the Tinamou is thought to be the closest we can get to the most recent common ancestor of birds in terms of its anatomy and behaviour, making it a good comparison for non-avian dinosaurs. By having these modern study animals, we are able to test how well the models we create work and validate them as a way to recreate the motion of extinct animals. Dr Peter Bishop is working on exactly that. Locomotion is an incredibly complex task, involving numerous bones, joints and many, many muscles, all coordinating with one another to produce movement. To understand how extinct archosaurs could have moved, one first needs a strong understanding of how movement is produced in modern animals. By integrating data from experiments and anatomy with sophisticated digital computer models, we can run simulations to explore aspects of leg function that are not easily understood from experiments alone, such as how muscles are recruited to produce force during the gait cycle. With a more developed understanding of how animals work, we can then apply these simulations to predict locomotor behaviour and performance in extinct species as well. In tandem with the studies of living archosaurs, our research involves CT scanning and modelling fossil archosaurs based on what we have learnt, and continuing to improve existing models. 
Using the models of extinct archosaurs, we are comparing the results of walking, running and jumping simulations, allowing us to clearly test how comparatively effective or efficient each movement is as it's performed by each animal, bringing extinct archosaurs digitally back to life. The team has already produced some exciting work in this area and is working on much more, as PhD student Romain Pintoir says. So on top of being at least bipedal and quadrupedal, Akoso had a wide morphological diversity with features like armor and spikes and long neck, with sizes ranging from small to massive, and this morphological diversity may have had an impact on the way this animal moved. So one way to relate both morphological diversity and body mass to locomotion is to perform 3D measurements of limb bones using geometric morphometrics. So I'm using 3D geometric morphometrics for my PhD project in Paris with the Gravy Bone Sister project of Dawn Dinos. And this tool allows me to study the shape differences between limb bones of every archosaur involved in the Dawn Dinos project while distinguishing the effect of body size on those shapes. So this is completely different from measuring the length of a bone because it uses anatomical points such as, such as muscular attachments as reference, putting the results in a clearer anatomical context. So ultimately this tool allows us to isolate which part of the bone is varying the most between bipeds and quadrupeds, or even between two quadrupeds that are rather small and big with different morphologies. So taking these shape differences into account will help to better assess the diversity and the evolution of locomotive functions in early archosaurs. At the end of our work, we hope to be able to say whether locomotion was indeed a factor that made dinosaurs superior to archosaurs, or not. Either way, we'll be able to help answer the question of whether locomotion was what ultimately gave dinosaurs an edge in survival and allowed them to go on to dominate the rest of the Mesozoic. We'd like to thank you for watching, and we would also like to thank the European Research Council for funding this project. Mm -hmm.